You always hear after a school shooter, well, I always knew back in third grade that that was going to be the kid that shot up the school. The heck didn't we do something about it in third grade? We got a lot of kids that are hurting right now, and that could really turn into something bad. We got to do something about it now. We got to have the tools and the legislation to mandate and make schools do it. That's what gets me fired up every day, by the way, if you can't tell. I'm Patrick Pacheco, and you're listening to season four of In Good Companies from Cadence Bank, the podcast where we have your best interest at heart. Because at Cadence, we're much more than a provider of financial services. We're a lifetime advocate driven by your success. In the old days, if you were attending a parent-teacher's conference, you could just show up, drive up to the school and put your name down on a sign-up sheet, check in, check out, that was it. But in recent years, as gun incidents and shootings in K-12 schools have become more frequent across the U.S., schools have had to adapt. According to a survey from the National Center for Education Statistics, two-thirds of our public schools now control access to their school grounds. And that's not simply regulating entry. It means getting equipment, hiring staff, designing action plans. So where do you start? Well, I'd recommend talking with today's guests. I'm David Rogers. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Raptor Technologies. David knows a lot about safety management. That's in part because he knows his technology. From software development to fintech, he has been in high-tech marketing for over 20 years. It's also because he works for Raptor Technologies, the U.S. leader in school security software. Once a family-owned business, Raptor works with 37,000 schools across the country today, helping them with software, equipment, and training. David came to Raptor because he wanted to do something meaningful and see the impact of his work. Today, he tells us how Raptor Tech has been shaping the industry and developing solutions for schools since 2002. He breaks down how we can make schools safer together and why this work needs to happen now. It all starts with a mission. So our mission is to protect every school, every child, every day. Our products fall under the umbrella of school safety software, um, but it really, it means so much more than that. Um, we started out the company in visitor management, trying to you know, make sure we could identify bad actors that would be trying to get in through the front door of the school and have really expanded out into a lot of uh, response technologies like panic alerts. But where we're really seeing more focus these days is how do we prevent things from happening uh, at these schools, bad things? And how do we help kids get on the best path? How do we put them in a position to succeed rather in, than a position where they might harm themselves or harm others? And so that's really what makes the mission ring so true here at Raptor is we really are delivering products that have an impact, make a difference, and at a great value, to be frank. We have great market share, and we continue to add these wonderful products that impact kids' lives. And, and uh, if that's not a reason to get out of bed every morning, I don't know what is. That's fantastic. So uh, your career is rooted in high tech. Your expertise is in marketing, but marketing means a lot of different things industry to industry. So what does marketing mean to Raptor Tech and to you? At Raptor Tech, it takes a lot of different forms. So a lot of it is uh, demand generation, you know, driving new business to the company, but it also takes the form of product marketing. We've been adding products over the last several years, and, uh, and that's a key piece. But a big part of my role actually is around government relations as well. So uh, the markets that Raptor deals in, particularly K-12 through uh, school market public education, there's a lot of mandates and policies that have come out over the last several years uh, and a lot of funding as well that uh, we, we try to both influence and, and make sure that uh, there's a level of playing field out there that's set by these state and local governments. So that also falls under the uh, umbrella of marketing here at Raptor. Like a lot of tech companies in the 2000s, Raptor Tech had humble beginnings. It started in the living room of Alan Meesum in Houston, Texas. But in a few years, it grew well beyond the confines of Alan's home. If you've ever met Alan Meesum, and I've met him a few times now, just a fun guy, a great guy. He started the company, it was a typical founder-led, you know, idea in the in the uh, somebody he corporate security had talked about needing something to help monitor the visitors. And he had created something, but he was talking to a, a local 
police official and said, you know what, we really need that in schools. And the light went off in his head and they started selling it there in the immediate Houston area. And pretty soon he was driving around the state and growing the business that way and and, uh, had significant impact here in Texas. He had first mover advantage. There were not many uh, folks out there doing that in K through 12 at that point in time, back in 2002. And then he had um, a police chief in Northeastern Florida who embraced it and then did a great job of evangelizing it across the state of Florida. And when you pick off Texas and Florida as your two biggest markets, you're gonna grow. And quite frankly, it hit a need that schools had. They didn't really have a good idea of who was coming through their doors. I'll give you an example. When my wife's school implemented it, they thought they knew everybody coming on their campus. But after two weeks, they had a contractor who had been coming on the campus for a year, turned out to be a sex offender. Wow. Yeah, they had to call police and everything. And that's the power of that very simple solution, right, that it brought through K through 12 schools. So Raptors had two kind of major players, a CEO, first Jim Vesterman, uh, I guess he's still a board member. Where was his leadership? And then with your new CEO, how did that change? Moving from Alan to Jim, um, he quickly grew to, I think it was like 7,000 customers across the U.S. And one of the neat things about Jim, I I love talking to him. Um, He is a former ex-military, he's a former Marine, and and he brought that discipline to the business that you got to have to be able to grow. you got to have formalized your processes, and you got to make sure, and particularly with software, that you're doing all the things on the back end uh, that make it scalable. And he you know, invested in marketing. He was a big believer in, in growing the marketing and, and growing the sales team. And so all of those were, were great investments that he put in place that ultimately, I think, set it up nice for when Gray came in. When Gray Hall took over as CEO in 2020, he wanted to take Raptor Global. To do that, he focused on what they did best. One of the things that Gray brought in was, we were, I think, looking at our identity there for a while. Are we going to be a broad market visitor management company? Are we going to go deep in the K-12 through vertical? And ultimately, I think where Gray steered us was going deep in that K-12 through vertical, being really good at school safety and you know, bringing other products on. Uh, and we've grown into multiple products uh, since Gray got here, uh, both uh, organically and through investment. Under Gray, we brought down an acquisition in the UK that also has schools around the world. It's, you know, there's potential to go into other markets. He just really was able to build on what Jim had put in place, but kind of really take it to the next level as well. And so just that next level of maturity grew us to 37,000 schools across the United States. So between the two of them, they took a, a great idea from Alan and he had handed it off to two very solid leaders uh, that made us the number one provider of this technology in the country. So my understanding is today, 35% of schools use Raptor, and in Texas, it's 70%. I mean, that's a huge number. What explains these numbers? Well, it's even gotten bigger. It's 80% in Texas now. So uh, actually, I was looking at at the private schools today in in Texas, and and I was thinking, oh, we got to go sell to the private schools. And I realized, oh my gosh, we have 95% of the private schools already using our visitor product. (laughs) There's a couple of things that drive it. One is the reputation of Raptor cannot be undersold. And it's a reputation around quality products, but also around customer service, because they all talk to each other. And quite frankly, a lot of these superintendents move around the country and they'll bring us with them because they're like, man, Raptor takes care of me. If I have, it's kind of like the old old days, you didn't get fired for bringing in IBM, right? Well, if you're a superintendent and superintendents are always on the hot seats these days, if you have Raptor as your safety and security software partner, you're not going to get in trouble. And, and so I think the customer service, the reputation and quality of our products has really been what's helped us grow. They're very well thought through. There's a lot of folks out there who might have a panic alert, but our panic alert includes you know, drill management, So, because schools have to manage and report all their drills up to the state, and you want them doing that, and, and you want them utilizing your technology so that they get that muscle memory of, of, of using it. So we built that in, and on the back end, we built in what's called reunification, and the easiest way to explain that is after an emergency, no matter what kind of emergency, parents want to get their kid back, and they want to know, are they safe? Are they at the hospital? Has something horrible happened? 
and they want to know that quickly and our technology enables that and we've bundled that together into a single solution uh, that's a great value and so I talk to a lot of legislators and I explain the things that our products do and and you can see the dollar signs ringing up in their eyes going okay how much is this going to cost me and then I say well you know if I unload the truck it's pretty much going to be less than the cost of a single projector that you put in your classroom these days or a smart screen or something like that and they're just going well, are you kidding that's that's not expensive at all when you compare that to other things on the market they're like wow look at everything you get from raptor and look at the quality of it it's uh, very compelling for school districts so all of those things combined really have turned us into the market leader we are life is full of financial decisions we've got the products services and people to help make them easier Stop by a branch or visit us online at cadencebank.com to find out why Cadence is the bank for you. Cadence Bank, member FDIC. Keeping your head straight in an emergency is hard. You're acting on instinct. Your adrenaline's pumping. You can't think about everything. That's where Raptor comes in. If you have a, an emergency, let's just call it a head off fire at a school and everybody evacuated and went to the reunification site, which might be like a convention center or something, you're, if you got 500 kids in that school, you're going to have 1,500 people show up, right? Because mom's going to show up, and dad's going to show up, and you know everybody's going to show up. It's like throwing a small concert, right? You got to handle bathrooms, you got to know water. Your kids and the parents can't go to the same bathroom. You got to make sure that whoever is coming to pick up that kid has custody of that kid because you don't want a parental abduction uh, or heaven forbid, you know, child trafficking. Somebody taking advantage of that situation. So there's a lot of things that have to go into it. You have to have somebody directing traffic. <laughs> so we practice this. We've even done like a, at a, a football game. We worked with a school district here in Texas that simulated a shooting at a football game where they had kids that had been dropped off by their parents and uh, needed to be reunified. And so we practiced that with them. But what was amazing is we sat there and we worked through the, all the scenario, how the panic alert worked, how they communicated between the different agencies, you know, and then we hot washed the whole thing afterwards and found out, you know, EMS wasn't on the same radio frequencies as everybody else and they weren't getting all the information. And it's only through this practice, and that's part of what we do, that these schools can really learn where their gaps are. And so that's part of the evaluation and, and an implementation process that we we put in play and try to assess their needs because all of our tools are very customizable. It's a very thought through and detailed process in, on how we work with uh, school districts and schools. When it comes to school safety, David is clear. Prevention is better than cure. It's really, you know, prevent, prepare, respond, recover. There's sort of the four major pillars. You hope you can prevent most things, and we the, really the challenge is, is let's try to prevent more things than we are today. The U.S. is very response-oriented. What you find is when you go beyond our borders is other developed countries are more preventative in their approach. Uh, we're very response-focused. We really try to look at each piece of that and what are the things that we can put in place to make you know prevention better, help preparation be stronger and better? Uh, how do we make sure people are responding correctly, contextually, and responding to the right thing, that they're not really a lockdown and they're evacuating? That is, you, know, you don't want to run into the, the arms of a shooter, right? So you want to make sure that the context is there, the response is fast. When you have a, any type of emergency, the faster you can get to that recovery stage, the better outcomes you're going to have, particularly for kids. So the mental health and well-being of children really plays through this whole thing. The mental health and well-being of, of staff. You know, if we can get products to market that make those things better, faster, easier, and help people un, you know, understand how to respond at every stage of those four pillars, then we're going to have fewer incidents and better outcomes. And that's ultimately, you know, that's what we're going for. With so much at stake, the quality of Raptor's product has to be second to none. So how do you achieve that? By getting a team that's skilled, razor sharp, and takes the mission to heart. One of the first things we do is we try to educate everybody on the products and the industry. And so we do uh, full-blown product training. 
And we actually created something called Wisdom Wednesday. <laughs> that whole concept was, you know, let's, we need to learn something. We're constant learners. It started with products. It's expanded out to, uh, you know, things like suicide awareness. It's been very impactful. You don't realize how many people have been touched by, by suicide. We build up skills. AI is a huge thing right now. And so we've had, you know, one, we designated one of our folks to be the AI expert and sent her to conferences, but she has to bring that back and, and teach. So we do a lot around that as well. We do a lot of work with I Love You Guys and Safe and Sound Schools, which are nonprofits in this space. And they put a lot of events and our folks get to go to those and participate and meet these people who have lost loved ones. It's certainly just an outgrowth of what we do as a company and the products that we build to make sure that people stay wired into what it is we're trying to do. The mission has always been first, but it also builds a great company. It's from the CEO down. Everybody believes in what we do. And we have this reputation of being transparent and honest and forthright as a company. And uh, that has only helped us be stronger and, and grow faster. I mean, that, very interesting, your company. You got to be driven by and yet affected by tragedy uh, and a great deal. And then here in Texas, I mean, we've, we've been touched by it as well, with the most recent being in Uvalde. Understand that we had the shooting in Uvalde. You actually brought in some folks, uh, counselors, to talk to your to your staff. You know, how does that affect the staff when something happens? It's hard. I mean, Uvalde, obviously, uh, being a Texas client, it hit home very close to home, and we did. We made resources available to our folks, uh, made sure that they they knew they were there, uh, and I had people on my team that were. It was tough. You had them as a client, and so making those resources available. And helping them work through it is very important. You know, it's funny when I interview people to come work on the marketing team, I, I warn them. I'm like, look, we're not writing about happy stuff. We're talking about suicide risk and abuse and school shootings. And we're talking about these things so they won't continue to happen. But we deal with tough things. And you need to have, have the ability uh, and the fortitude to be able to deal with that day in, day out. I've had people say, you know what, I can't do it. But the people that come in, they are all about what we do. I got a tough team. They have dealt with some some really tough subjects. And in the face of Uvalde, they really withstood it. And I was proud of the ones that reached up their hand and said, I need help through this. And I'll, I'll tell you, I was one of them. When it comes to school safety, shootings command the headlines but they're not the only risk. So a big one is suicide risk. The number two killer of children between the ages of 10 and 14 is suicide. And if you think about 10 to 14, that age range, oh my gosh, right? Going from elementary school to high school, that's a critical time. And quite frankly, while not everybody who is suicidal is homicidal, pretty much everybody who's homicidal is suicidal, right? You can start to spot these behaviors that might lead to harm to self and do something about it. So, yeah, suicide risk is a big one. Abuse uh, in the UK, the safeguarding tools that we have in place are really great for spotting abuse and doing something about it. That, quite frankly, that's why they passed the law for safeguarding in the UK. Uh, you had a, an immigrant child who was there with an aunt who had a boyfriend, and that boyfriend and aunt slowly beat and starved that child to death. And everybody at the school had a piece of information, but nobody connected the dots. And having software be able to do that and making it easy for teachers and bus drivers and coaches and cafeteria workers to just log a concern. You know what? I saw, I saw Sally eating out of the trash can. I saw bruises on Sally's arms and legs. You know, Sally was hiding under her desk today. You know, all those things by themselves, you know, maybe not, may not have rose to the level of let's do something about it immediately. But if all three of those things happen in one week and it popped in the counselor's inbox, you're darn right they're going to do something about it. There's a lot of things in terms of where we're bringing in prevention tools that I think uh, will really have a tremendous impact on uh, U.S. students. Are you guys seeing, or do you focus at all on this COVID tranche of kids that for two years kind of lost society, lost school, lost every? Are you seeing anything there? Are you really focus on that? Is it something that's starting to play out? I think probably why we're having so many folks 
nod their heads when we talk about some of this prevention technology. It's called Student Safe, by the way. I probably should have plugged my product way earlier as the marketing guy. But when you talk to legislators at a macro level, they're seeing all that data that's being produced in their state or in their in their district of behavioral issues, more emotional issues, increased suicide attempts. They're seeing all of this data and they're like, how do we get in front of this? How do we deal with that? We have a psychologist who works on our on our staff, uh, Dr. Amy Grosso, and I, she has this great quote. She hates it when I attribute it to her, but she's like, you know, kids were screwed up before COVID <laughs> and now they're really screwed up, <laughs> right? <laughs> Just last school year alone, Student Safe uh, registered 17 million notifications, you know, because, you know, teachers were capturing this stuff. You always hear after, it's always in, in, like a TV interview after a school shooter. You got some teacher that had that kid in third grade. Well, I always knew back in third grade that that was going to be the kid that shot up the school. So why the heck didn't we do something about it in third grade? right? We got a lot of kids that are hurting right now, and that could really turn into something bad. We got to do something about it now. We got to have the tools and the legislation to mandate and make schools do it. That's what gets me fired up every day, by the way, if you can't tell. It is kind of amazing that we are, that the United States is such a reaction-based society as opposed to a prevention-based society. And are you seeing any shift in that? Or is it a distinct shift or does it still tend to come after something happens, all of a sudden there's an uptick in activity? It's happening. And I'm seeing it from both sides of the aisle politically. People are starting to lose the, the stigma around wanting to talk about or not wanting to talk about mental health and wellness and suicide. Everybody's being impacted by it. Everybody was impacted by COVID. You know, you were people were losing family and friends. And I think everybody's like waking up going, we need to do something about this. We don't do anything quickly, but I think we're starting to head the right direction. And I think there are some things that we need to continue to work on. Um, there are societal issues that we need to continue to work through. You obviously want to keep the bad actors off the campus. Uh, that's a good start. But at the end of the day, if you can see a kid early that something's going on in their lives and do something about it, wrap the services around it. And quite a, if they continue to go off the rails, and let's just face it, there's going to be some kids that go off the rails, right? I'm pretty sure my parents thought that was going to be me, mom and dad. I'm, I, I turned out all right. <laughs> but you also need to be able to you know, deal with the threats and, and handle those things as well. Here in Texas, if you have a kid who's homicidal, showing homicidal ideation, and it's been diagnosed, you're not going to find a hospital bed at a psychiatric hospital for them. They don't want to take them. They don't want the liability, right? Where do they go? They go back into the school with a minder. That's frightening, right? That's crazy. Right? That's crazy. Uh, but it's happening, and it's happening in you know, a lot of states. We need to continue to expand you know, mental health services and things. And, and that's, that's not just a, a Raptor issue. That's a U.S. issue. I get it. But we need to be able to address it both as a society and from a governmental standpoint as well. To address these issues, Raptor works hand-in-hand -hand with school districts and legislators. But sometimes there's pushback. It takes time to see eye-to-eye. -eye. So first off, there are school districts that are absolutely 100% bought in. So that's, that's part of it. But like a lot of things in this world, not everybody talks to everybody else. And so uh, school districts aren't always talking to law enforcement. You know, kind of everybody operates in their bubble. So it's sort of getting those those worlds to collide a little bit is super important. We help facilitate that. Some districts want to pretend that they don't have a problem. There are some out there that you wonder what they're thinking, <laughs> to be honest with you, and where they're placing their investments. And so um, it, it just kind of reflects government and, and opinions and things across the country. It's, it's a mixed bag. Some small schools want to pretend, hey, we know everybody in our community. This would never happen here. Talk to uh, uh, my friend Kim Miller at, at Uvalde, and he'll tell you nobody in Uvalde ever thought that would happen there. They knew everybody knew everybody. We know all the kids. And he will tell you that kid completely fell off everybody's radar, and, but yet there he was. And it tore that community apart. And so I think the, the pushback usually is, oh, well, you know, we don't have the funds. 
what all we can do is uh, both as marketers and as salespeople and, and product developers is put something in their lap that they can afford to deploy, uh, give them the resources to deploy it and see it make a difference. And I will tell you, there's plenty of funds out there, <laughs> both from the feds and at the state level. But I also, I'll also say there's a lot of other things beyond what, you know, when they think of security, Raptor might not be the first thing on their list. I mean, you know, a lot of them need to fix their fencing and they need to have, you know, bulletproof film and they need cameras and they need an uh, armed security guard on the campus. And so sometimes it's priority. Sometimes it's they just want to put their head in the sand. Ultimately, I, I think the state governments are, are fixing that. They're putting mandates in place. They've Everybody's woken up. Nobody wants uh, to be having that press conference about, you know, something happening in their state. No governor wants that for sure. So I think folks are really coming around to it. For David, school safety is a collective question. That's why he calls on parents to raise their concerns as well. It's only by taking action that you can push for change. Parents need to get involved. And the more they do, the better it's going to be. And that's asking questions right? Pushing the administrators. Those principals got a lot of sway. I'm just telling you right now, principals out of school have a lot of sway. And when you push them and you ask the questions and you're not afraid to ask those questions around safety and security, when they know their parents are thinking about it, they're going to start thinking about it. Right after Uvalde, our PR agency guy who works for us, who's our account manager, he was pulling up to pick up his kid at an elementary school and he looked over and there was a door propped open with a rock. This was the day after Uvalde. And he went over and he got that rock and he closed that door until he heard it snap into the lock position. And he walked into the principal's office and you know, they, they checked him in with Raptor <laughs> and they said, I'd like to meet with the principal. And he showed her the rock and he's like, really? The day after Uvalde, I pull up and there's a rock propping open a side door. That's involvement. He brought, he brought the rock. Wherever you send your kids to school, you should be looking at how safe is that school because you want your kids to be able to learn in a safe environment, and, and that's important. Well, I think that's some fantastic advice. I don't know that all parents, and probably a larger degree now, but I don't know that all parents literally think about what are the safety aspects of my kid's school. I don't think that's something that's a common approach. It's probably something every parent needs to be thinking about. I think we're all, you know, all of us who are parents and, you know, we want our kids to go to a, a school that's safe, but quite frankly, even up until a few years ago, it's not even something you always thought about. You sort of assumed it was safe. I'm going to give credit to the families who have lost loved ones in some of these tragic incidents and think Sandy Hook, Parkland, Santa Fe, Columbine. Those brave parents who have gone to the legislatures and have gone out and pushed some of these ideas. I'll give you an example. Uh, the concept of panic alert buttons in the schools was, has really been driven by uh, a woman named Lori Aladef who lost her daughter, uh, Alyssa Aladef, at Parkland. She has worked tirelessly around the country, and we have supported her in her efforts to make response time, you know, making sure that everybody on campus understands there's an emergency and how they should respond, and making sure that first responders understand what type of emergency is, because seconds count in these types of emergencies. She has been tireless in driving that. I think of uh, Michelle Gay, who lost her daughter at Sandy Hook. And, you know, she has been very focused on, you know, hey, let's not forget about kids who have special needs. How do we spot some of these problems early so that we can uh, deal with them so that they don't turn into the next shooter? So I think of the parents that have lost the most, that have really given the most back into this industry. It takes a village to raise a child and keep them safe. Software developers, legislators, teachers, families, we all have a part to play. At Raptor Tech, David and his team will continue to uphold their end of the bargain because they believe in the power of their product. Technology can make a difference. It can make a big difference. And that's one of the things that, that Raptor has really proven. We were one of the early pioneers of bringing this type of software into the industry. We'll continue to grow it out, but it, it really it can really have an impact. You, know, you can run a, a business like Raptor and be very successful, very profitable, do all the things that you want a business to do, but still have a mission. 
and be passionate about what you do. And that's exciting for me. I've been in a lot of different industries. I've, you know, was in semiconductor in the early days of the smartphone. I've built natural catastrophe models at one point in my career. I've done fintech software and things like that. None of those things got me out of bed in the morning the way the, the Raptor mission does. The people I meet and the people I talk to uh, every day reinforce why I do this job and why everybody on the executive team all, and then all the way down through our entire staff, why they do the job. So it's not lost on our customers. It's not lost on people who work in this industry. We're known for that. And it's, it kind of makes you feel pretty good. They're like, yeah, those Raptor people, they get it. And those Raptor people, there's a lot we can learn from them. So whether you're a parent educating yourself or a superintendent trying to get ahead of the problem, here's what you need to know. Safety management technology is a crucial tool during an emergency. It helps you stay organized and efficient. Once you're properly equipped, you can anticipate scenarios so that no one gets left behind. Safety is also about being proactive. That means spotting risky behaviors and reporting them. Prevention also means raising your voice. So take initiative at school and push for change at the legislative level. Ultimately, school safety is about creating a support network around your communities. Those who have lost loved ones in recent years have played a crucial role in making safety issues visible. Let's follow their lead and work alongside companies like Raptor Tech to protect every school, every child, every day. I'd like to thank David Rogers for sharing the story of Raptor Technologies. His passion and dedication to their mission is nothing short of inspiring. In Good Companies is a podcast from Cadence Bank, member FDIC, equal opportunity lender. Our production team is Sheena Cochran, Edie Pingeli, and Natalie Barron. Our executive producer is Danielle Cornell. This podcast is made in collaboration with the team at Lower Street. Writing and production from Andrew Gannam and Lise Lavati. Sound design and mixing by Ben Cranley. This podcast is provided as a free service to you and is for general informational purposes only. Cadence Bank makes no representations or warranties as to the accuracy, completeness, or timeliness of the content in the podcast. The podcast is not intended to provide legal, accounting, or tax advice and should not be relied upon for such purposes. To the extent that this podcast includes predictions about the economy, these predictions are subject to a number of variables and you should confer with your legal, accounting, and tax advisors for their input regarding the possible outcomes of any economic subject matter discussed herein.